Okay, thank you very much for the uh, for the introduction and the invitation to to um, give this talk um, to talk about um, my work, which is uh, on uh, stellar abundances, and I, it's my pleasure to be here. On, um, please, if you have any questions, just uh, interrupt me and and ask them as we go along. Um, so the title of my talk is the um, past, present, and future of the R process enhanced stars. Um, so as this entails, I'll talk a little bit about the history of R process enhanced stars. Hopefully, say something about where we are today and the future. Um, but just to give a little bit of background as to why are we all even talking about R process enhanced stars and, and what are they? Um, so this all stems from a uh, um, desire to know where all the elements in our periodic table come from. And um, as we all know, we have this uh, bottom part down here, all the heavy ones, which are created in the uh, neutron capture process. And we have about half of them, which are created in the rapid neutron capture process and the other half in the uh, slow neutron capture process. And this particular version of the periodic table emerged sometime in 2007. We had a very exciting neutron star merger event where we saw um, a light curve, which uh, showed clear evidence of the decay of heavy uh, elements. So we saw the uh, products of a R process event to that light curve. And this, as I said, then this uh, version of the periodic table came up where it sort of said, okay, well, all these R process enhanced elements are produced in neutron star mergers. But as I hope everybody on this, a little premature, um, and that uh, particular event actually sort of a lot of um, theoretical work um, into other types of uh, sources that could process uh, elements. And I'm not going to go into detail of any of these. I'm just going to show these pretty artist uh, pictures of these events. Um, we have the neutron star mergers, which we now know is the source, um, but uh, We've also heard about collapsars that can be produced in these neutron capture elements. Just uh, in the last Dina seminar, I think we heard about these uh, jet supernovae, which also seems to produce them. And then there are the regular core collapse supernovae, which may still not see, they still not produce the very heavy elements, but they might still be a contestant for the, for the lighter elements, uh, like strontium, deuterium, zirconium. So we still have this wealth of sources that uh, could all in the neutron capture elements that uh, we have in the universe. And we still need to sort of figure out what's where and what came from where. And I'm a stellar spectroscopist, so I want to do this, this with stars. Um, and this is just a slide to remind people why stars are excellent objects or excellent tools for, for um, analyzing or for investigating neutron capture or synthesis events in the other universe. GML core stars are the lowest. Uh, their abundance is, is basically a direct fingerprint of the chemical uh, composition of the cloud from which they were born. Um, so we consist of the stars to say what um, happened in or what enriched this gas cloud from which they were born. But um, it gets a little bit different when you go up to solar-like stars um, because they've seen thousands of different enrichment events and their abundance pattern is basically comparable to these events that go into to, to their chemical signature. And also because they are so rich in, uh, in metals, uh, so anything heavier than hydrogen and helium, you see the, at the bottom here, we have the solar spectrum, uh, bottom on the left here, and you see all these uh, beautiful absorption lines, but it gets really hard to each single one of them and get an actual abundance out. Um, so what we really wanna do is that we wanna go back in time. We wanna go back to when the uh, universe was uh, simpler from the enrichment events. And we do that when we look at more male poor stars. Um, so they basically, uh, the gas cloud from which they were formed were enriched with fewer and fewer events. And we go all the way back. We can find stars that represent only a couple of nuclear synthesis events. And we get this very clear signature uh, of the uh, yields that were produced. However, as you can also see in the spectra, as we go to more and more male poor stars, we also have less and less lines. Um, so it's, and the lines become weaker. So it gets, uh, so even though it gets easier because we have single lines that are not blended, we have weaker lines and fewer lines to do this work with. 
Um, so Melpore stars are great, but it's it also uh, there are also some caveats. Um, but when we talk about um, nutrient capture elements, then we should look about look at which of those have uh, absorption lines in the stellar spectrum, and that's what I'm showing you this plot. So all the um, blue stars here, blue stars, have lines in the optical uh, spectrum of stars, or could have lines in the optical spectrum of stars if the element is in the star. Uh, and we can, in principle, measure, measure the abundances of all of these elements. So that's a lar large number of elements for uh, nutrient capture elements. The ones that are marked in red, we can only get with uh, space spectroscopy because they are so far, the lines of these elements are so far in the also that we can't observe them ground, but we can get them with space telescope spectroscopy, for instance. Um, so in principle, we can get a very complete um, nutrient capture element abundance pattern in male poor stars if the elements are there. Uh, and then I just put the uh, stellar notation, stellar abundance notation down here at the bottom, uh, just to remind people what the bracket notation is, that we have the abundance in the star relative to that in the sun, and then we have the log epsilon abundance notation, which uh, represents the absolute abundance of the star. Okay, so um, for the R process, we're actually lucky because as this, the title of this talk um, entails, there are stars that are enhanced in rapid capture, and that's very uh, easily detectable in their spectra. So this is a spectra snippet from two stars, the red star, is uh, a normal melt pore star and the blue one is an R process enhanced melt pore star. And you can see it has these very uh, absorption lines, for instance, europium over here, which is very clearly visible, but other other elements like lanthanum, barium, and dysprosium and stuff like that. So this uh, really helps us when we, um, when we want to, to uh, investigate the rapid nutrient capture process because there are a subset of these stars. Um, the first one of these was discovered in 1982. Um, so this is the year before I was born. So this, this field of research has been around for as long as I have, which is very proud. Um, this is uh, a guy called HD 115444. And it's a very fairly bright star. Um, and this was uh, uh, analyzed by Griffin in 1982. And what they found here was that uh, when they plot the abundances of this star relative to uh, iron and relative to the sun, you find these uh, enhanced uh, levels of barium, lanthanum, and europium. And you also have this uh, higher europium than barium. So this is most likely uh, an R process that enriched the star. Um, however, I think when we all think about the first R process enhanced star, this is the one we talk about. Um, so this is the CS22892-052. Um, which was discovered in, in 95 and where they won over um, and where they were able to measure a whole range of nutrient capture element abundances in this star. And what they did and what they've, we've done ever since is that they plotted the uh, absolute abundances of the star as a function of the atomic number of the elements and then they scale the solar system R process abundance pattern and the solar system S process abundance pattern uh, to the uh, abundances of this star. And what they found, which is very clear here with the solid line, is that the solar system R process abundance pattern was an almost perfect mid match to the uh, heavy element abundance pattern of this star. And this star is, um, it has a velocity of minus three, so it's, it's very old. Um, and so it's, it was striking that this pattern is the same in a young star like the sun and an old star like this one. Um, and on the right, you just see that when they got uh, better spectra and they could measure more elements, they could see that this perfect match to the solar system R process abundance pattern, which is the uh, blue line in this plot, um, is um, it's, it's a match from around barium and up to half you have this very nice match, which we now call the universal R process abundance pattern. Uh, but then for the uh, more heavy elements like thorium, uh, you, you see some deviations. And also in the lighter element range, you see, see some deviations. Um, so that was a great start. Um, and then 
people went out to look for more stars. So the first really dedicated search for uh, our process enhanced stars was uh, this uh, Hamburg ESO our process enhanced star survey, which was presented in a paper by Barclum in 2005. Incidentally, this was also the year that I started university. <laughs> so we sort of, I sort of followed the, the R process evolution. Um, and here in this work, they took a spectra of uh, 200, about 250 stars and they found eight of them, which shows this huge enhancement in R process elements, uh, which is found with the European enhancement of, of plus one dex. Um, so eight out of 253 is about 3%. So these stars are really rare. Um, the plots here just show a couple of these stars, these R process nine stars, uh, which they measured elements in. And again, the solar system R process abundance pattern, uh, which seems to be a, a nice fit, at least to the, to the heavy elements. Um, so yeah, these, these are really rare, um, but over the next years, some more were discovered. And when I did a, uh, I did a literature search for this talk, and I found that um, Actually, we know about 60 stars, which has a European to iron enhancement of about uh, back to why this 0.7 instead of plus one. Um, if we keep the plus one uh, discriminator, then this number will drop to about 30. Um, but let's just keep it at, at the 0.7. And then, of course, they need to have a barium to European uh, ratio less than zero to have to be, be sure that it's, it's an R process. Um, so this is sort of from uh, 95 and up until now that these 60, 60 stars. Uh, then when I looked at the detailed abundances that we actually have for these stars, it turned out that only 15 of them have uh, abundances derived for 15 or more Eugene capture elements. It's kind of coincidence that it's 15 and 15, but that was how it is. Um, and that's what I've plotted in this figure, uh, again, with the scaled uh, abundances on the the scaled absolute abundances on the y-axis as a function of the atomic number, and then all the references for these different papers here at the bottom. Um, and the, all of the abundance patterns are scaled to europium, so that's a really nice <laughs> fit there. Um, but as you, it's what what is evident from this plot and from all the plots in, in all of these different papers cited here at the bottom is that all of these stars actually show this universal R process abundance patterns. So in this range from barium to hafnium, you have this very good match to the solar system R process abundance pattern. And then when you go to the lighter elements, you see a larger scatter. And when you go to the heavier elements, you see a larger scatter. Um, but what is also evident from this plot is that, uh, so all of these stars obviously have the abundances measured in this middle range from barium to hafnium. Um, but when you go up to uranium, for instance, only three stars have uranium measured. Um, very few stars at lead measured. Uh, also these third peak elements uh, are only measured in a couple of stars. Um, and again, the lighter elements, well, we have strong image into cornium, but for the ones that come after, it gets um, the sample of stars which has elements in these, uh, or which has these elements measured uh, becomes fewer. Um, so, so there are still um, not that many stars which, for which we have a very, complete R process abundance pattern. There is, of course, this one guy here where we have uh, HST photometry or HST spectra, um, which has like everything measured in that's very nice. Um, but we need more of those. Um, so just to recap, I mean, we have these 60 stars and we've done this for a while, or people have done this for a while. Um, so, but, but really what we, overall, what we know from these 60 stars, this universal pattern from barium to half that's just the scale solar system are in the light R process elements, which as many has been interpreted as a suggestion of multiple formation channels. Um, hasn't really been that much more um, precise if, uh, development in, in that direction, just saying that, well, we have uh, normal co collapse supernova that could come in. There's all sorts of other uh, um, astrophysical objects that can create these elements. Um, and then we have a subset of the stars which subset which uh, exhibits what's called an actinite boost, and that's seen in the um, thorium and uranium abundances, where uh, a few of the stars that we know seems to have um, even more enhanced uh, abundances of those elements than the uh, than the normal process elements, and which creates the scatter in the in the heavy element or in the heavy 
uh, element range. So why is it that, um, I mean, I, sh I showed you this just in the beginning of the talk saying, look at all these lovely elements that has lines in the spectra of stars. So why don't we have these very complete abundance patterns for all of these 60 stars that are clearly enhanced in, in rapid neutron capture elements. So I mean, all of these elements should be able to be measured in, in those stars in that sample of, of 60 stars. Um, and that's because this is, uh, this is hard work. Um, and those of you who've seen some of my talks before have also seen these slides before. So, I mean, there are elements that have strong, easily measurable absorption lines in stellar spectra. These are strong and barium in Europe. And the bonuses for those in almost any male poor star that we look at, at least strontium and barium. It gets already there, it gets a little bit difficult. Um, but then when we go to some of the elements that we really want in these stars, some of the uh, capture elements and, and uh, third peak elements, um, like silver, palladium, um, and osmium and iridium, we see that the lines are weak. Uh, there are fewer lines. Um, they're in the very blue part of the, sea, the wavelength range on the x-axis here. We're down at uh, 3,200 angstroms, uh, which is very blue. Um, there's not a lot of coming from the star in this, uh, in this wavelength range. And we also run into that some of the lines are blended, uh, like this iridium line uh, wedged in between two other strong lines of elements. And you have an osmium line here, which is blended with the samarium line. So it gets really difficult to, to get abundances for these elements because the lines are just difficult to work with. Um, and then there's, of course, uh, uranium, which is an eternal headache of stellar spectroscopists because um, we have one line with, and it is, as you can see, this plot is in the wing of this very strong uh, ion line. So even though for this star, for uh, in particular, this one on the top left, uh, it has a huge uranium uh, enhancement, um, but it only turns out in this very bump of a line, um, which you really need really high resolution, high signal noise spectra to, to be able to measure, which is also why it hasn't been measured in that many stars. The one, if we want to get lead in these stars, we also need Um, and as you can see, there's a CH line right here next to it. So if there's any carbon enhancement, which well, poor stars, then this line becomes blended and really difficult to work with. So, so, so it's, it's really hard work. And the current sample of highly opposite enhanced stars that we have in the literature are faint. And that's basically why we haven't been able to get better abundances for them. So that I try to show with these two figures or these, this histogram, this figure. So on the right here, you have the um, V magnitude of the literature uh, opera system enhanced stars, and then the number of Newton capture element abundances that has been derived from those spectra. And you can see we have a whole chunk down here in the lower left corner, which are faint stars and which only have, uh, well, they have less than 10 abundances measurement. Measured. Of course, there are a few stars that has been studied in great detail and where people have invested lots of telescope time to get these elements um, and, and they have a nicer uh, pattern. But generally, um, all of these faint stars have, have few measurements, which is also what I've plotted in, in the histogram here on the left, where you have the number of our two stars on the y-axis and then the number of newly capped elements uh, derived in the spectra on the x-axis and you can see we have this vast majority of the stars lie down here and that's simply because they are um, or one of the reasons is that they're faint so it's really hard to get good enough spectra to do the abundances of these stars. So um, what do we do? What do we need? Well um, as I said we have these 60 highly opposite and stars but they're faint so, or um, but, but we need more stars um, I'm a stellar person. This is one of my answers to everything. We need more stars, always need more stars. Um, but it's not enough to just have more. We need them to be um, brighter so we can actually get proper spectra of them. And then as uh, I talked about the abundance pattern in the current sample of 60 stars, um, I also mentioned all the 
or maybe some of you noticed the wealth of references that were at the bottom, uh, which means that most of those stars have been analyzed by one group and then another group analyzes another star and the third group analyzes the third star. And some of them even have uh, the light neutron capture elements analyzed by one group and the heavy analyzed by another group. Um, so it's a very inhomogeneous abundance sample. So we need to have a uh, analysis of these stars so that we can better assess what the scatter in the abundances actually uh, just be able to ascribe that to different analysis method. So this is where our uh, process alliance comes in as the knight in shiny armor, or at least with a very fancy logo, thanks to uh, Erica Hornbeck. Um, so the Opercess Alliance is a collaboration that we started in 2016, um, where a group of uh, stellar spectroscopy people sort of came together and said, okay, let's, uh, let's make a push to, to get more stars and see if we can, we can uh, do something about this R process uh, questions that, that still uh, happens or that's, that's still out there, that's still not answered. Um, so we, the first phase of the R process lines is to uh, gather spectra of stars and find more of these R process enhanced stars. So to do that, we look at, or we get spectra of bright stars. So we can, um, first of all, as I said earlier, these the R process enhanced stars are, <laughs> uh, to go through a lot of male poor stars to find them. Um, and that helps if they're bright, then we don't need to do so much telescope time, but also, when we then find them, they will be bright so we can actually get decent uh, high resolution spectra of them. Then we chose them to be cold so that we're sure that we can measure the abundances. Um, stellar absorption lines are more prominent in cold stars than in hot stars. So if you uh, look at a sample of cold stars, you can do this more easily. And then of course we pick them to be metal poor so that their abundance patterns only um, reflect a uh, one or two nuclear synthesis events. So uh, we went out and did this. Uh, we started in 2016 and um, we uh, got time on a bunch of uh, two meter class telescopes. The top one here is the Dupont um, telescope at Las Campanas and the McDonald telescope at McDonald Observatory, um, where I've spent many nights looking for these stars. Uh, it's a very high resolution, so about 25,000 uh, high signal to noise, which some say was about 30 uh, at uh, four angstroms. And then we and they pop out very nicely. So this is uh, at the bottom left here, you have um, spectra of two stars. So the top one is a non R process enhanced star, and you have this beautiful European line, strong. He actually also has this uh, dysprosium line on the other side here, which uh, turned out to be a very uh, significant telltale that this was an R-process enhanced star. Um, so as I said, we've done this since 2000, uh, 2000 stars by now. Um, and we've um, published abundances for Strontropium for about 60, 600 stars. Uh, in our four data release papers, two of which came out in 2018, and another two uh, came out this year. Um, and so when we go through these stars and look at the abundance of them, we put them into three different categories of R process enhanced stars. So we have, and this is just the spectra um, representative of those three groups. So at the bottom here, we have the highly R process enhanced stars. So we have a large European abundance. Um, but we also have strong barium lines and strong strontium lines. And then in the middle here, we have the mildly r process enhanced stars, so the R1 stars, which just basically show the same type of pattern, just with um, weaker lines. But then we've also sought out to identify what we call limited R stars. And these are stars that have a lot stronger absorption of the, uh, or, or docked a lot more of the uh, light neutron capture elements here represented by strontium than they have of the higher or heavier neutron capture elements, such as barium and europium. Um, and this is the main result of all of our uh, analyzed stars. So we have discovered two of these highly R-process enhanced stars. 
we have a huge number of these mildly opposite and hem stars, and then we have a small sample of these limited R stars also. Um, and this is all plotted in this um, from uh, the RPA DR4 paper, which uh, Erica Hornbeck put out this year. And um, this sort of also shows why we chose to, to revisit the division of uh, or the europium division line for R1 and R2 star because it seems like there's a, this really um, visible drop in a uh, number of stars when you go from below 0.7 to above 0.7 in uh, europium enhancement. Um, so this is sort of this prompted this new division line. Um, but what we can see from this figure is that, um, well, we have all these nice stars, but also we find uh, there are two stars, which are the squared um, pink uh, symbols here. We find those over the entire molicity range of our sample. So we find them all the way up to like minus one in molicity. Um, the uh, bright ones are just ones from the DF four paper and the faded ones are the ones from the other uh, data release papers. Then we have this wealth of um, R1 stars, which are the uh, green triangles. And again, we also find those uh, over our entire molicity range. But then when we look at the limited R stars, we actually only find those at the lower molicity. So these are the um, green diamonds here. Um, and those are, are primarily at the lower molicity. So either that channel is, seems to be more uh, active at low molicity or it gets overpowered by the signature of the uh, main R process channel when we go up to higher molicities. Um, yeah, so, so we've done really good. We found all these stars. And this is just to show you how, so as, as I said earlier, one of the issues with the literature sample is that it's too faint to really work with. So this is just the um, V magnitudes for the RPA sample of our two stars. Um, here in the, the dashed line is the literature sample um, and the blue line is the um, RPA sample. Um, so as you can see, we are markedly brighter than the literature sample, um, which um, is, is a great advantage of the sample and which will mean that we can um, get better abundances for these stars. And one of the things that we're going to do once we get um, uh, these stars analyzed and we pick out the, the highly opposite enhanced stars is that we're go going to go and get what we call portrait spectra of these stars. So these are spectra that have an even higher resolution, um, so are 80,000 or higher, and a really high signal to noise. Um, so about 100, uh, our aim is to have a signal to noise of 100 with, at the uranium line at this uh, 38. Uh, 59 line. Um, and this uh, figure from the paper that Ian Roder put out two years ago really illustrates why why doing high resolution, high signals, noise spectra. Um, because this is one of the R2 stars that uh, he discovered. Enhanced. At the bottom here, you see the entire wave from that Ian got um, for the star. And at the left here, um, all of these, this, this wealth of lines that if you zoom in, uh, you see why, you see that, that, that they're only, first, first of all, they're only really resolved and you can only do the sort of individual line measurements if you get this high resolution, but also the signal's noise is evident because you have this huge amount of extra uh, lines due to the Nugent cat transmit. Um, so, so, so we we really need these um, high high signal noise, high resolution spectra to facilitate this type of analysis uh, that we want to do with these stars. But we can get that in a slightly less telescope time consuming than, than for the literature sample. Um, we have, uh, so we've not only done uh, strontium, barium, and europium abundances for some of these, some of them uh, without uh, the portrait spectra and some of them was 
just interesting enough to do a detailed analysis. And so this is the same plot as you've seen for the literature sample with the uh, scaled differences on the y-axis and the atomic number on the x-axis and the solar system R process abundance pattern as the solid line. But this is for R, R process alliance sample only. So these are six stars that we've published um, detailed Newton care. I think three of these are portrait spectra, the other three are just snapshot spectra. Um, but what is evident here is that we are actually able to get uh, abundances for the entire range of neutral capture elements, and we've managed to add two uranium measurements to the sample, um, almost doubling it. We get thorium in almost all of our stars. We get uh, osmium and iridium in all of our stars, um, also, and also in And it's a very large number of R process enhanced stars. Um, and I'll skip that one. Okay, so I just wanted to touch upon, so we have these R process enhanced stars that are discovered in the Milky Way halo, and um, the R process alliance is doing a great job in finding more of them. Um, but I just wanted to touch on that we also find them in uh, dwarf galaxies, and in particularly in ultra faint dwarf galaxies. Um, and you probably all know this guy, which is uh, Reticulum 2, that was discovered uh, now four years ago, um, where you have these uh, seven of the nine stars analyzed showed this extreme enhancement in, in R process elements. And these are the red points in these three plots, which show the strontium, barium, and europium abundances of the stars. Um, this was the first uh, ultra faint dwarf galaxy where you saw this extreme enrichment of the other. Uh, also think dwarf galaxy stars that have been analyzed are showed in, in different color plots, uh, points here. And the uh, Milky Way halo sample is shown in, in gray points in the back. Um, so th for the first time, we actually had a uh, proposed birth environment for these types of stars, uh, since the, the stars in the Milky Way halo were probably born in, in systems like Reticulum 2 and then later accreted onto the halo. Um, but Reticulum 2 is not the only one. Um, shortly after, we found another uh, ultra faint dwarf galaxy also showing R process enhancement. This is Tucana 3. Um, here, again, you have the strontium, barium, and europium uh, abundances. This is from. Um, and the Tucana 3 stars are the color stars and the diamond here. And we see that they don't have as strong as an enhancement as the Reticulum 2 stars, which are uh, plotted as the purple. But they show, uh, but all of the stars in this that we analyzed in this galaxy show this mild enhancement in in R process elements. Um, Tucana three shows uh, tidal tails, and there's it's been suggested that this galaxy was maybe more massive in the past, and that could maybe explain why you see this this low enhancement because there might have been more gas to dilute the the R process event. Um, but nevertheless, we have this this overall enhancement. Um, and then there's the third one, which came out this year, which is Crew 2. Um, and this galaxy, we had only three stars to work with. This is the problem with these ultra faint dwarf galaxies that we don't have a lot of stars to work with because they're so faint. But again, um, plotted here are the barium, europium, and strontium abundances for the um, Crew 2 stars, which is the uh, black stars. And the other ultra faint dwarf galaxies are the colored dots and Milky Way halo stars are the gray dots. Um, and we were able to get a, a europium abundance in one of the stars, this middle one, which shows sort of a mild enhancement. Uh, the other two stars, the more male poor stars, we could only get upper limits. But if you look at the barium and strontium abundances of the other two stars, you can see that there's a clear offset between uh, the two uh, most male or the two male poor stars to the, the more male rich star in this galaxy, uh, suggesting that there was definitely some. Uh, Newton capture enrichment event that happened um, to that, that enriched this third star. Um, so we have this family of um, um, ultra faint dwarf galaxies, these stars, different levels of enhancement and different um, amounts of stars that are enhanced in these systems. And all of that will help us to say something about the birth environment of these stars and 
uh, the buildup of the sample that we have in the Milky Way. And one of this is actually also have uh, an opera system hand started in the stellar stream. So stellar streams are these um, remnants of small systems that were accreted, accreted onto the Milky Way uh, and that we can now find due to uh, deep photometric surveys and Gaia. And one of the uh, efforts that has done this is the S5, the Southern Stellar Stream Survey, and I might not do that. Um, but we put out this paper earlier this year where we measured abundances, 42 stars spread over seven different streams. And one of the streams that we analyzed was the Indus stream, which is um, plotted in these uh, mutant capture element plots as this uh, purple cross. And you can see one of the stars has a very high abundance of europium, lanthium, diprotium, barium, and other mutant capture elements. Um, so it's, it's clearly highly enhanced in, in our process elements. The other stars in the stream uh, sort of lie down here with the rest of them. Um, Indus is a dwarf galaxy that was accreted. Um, and so we did some further analysis of this one star in Indus, and this is uh, work in progress. We're still not uh, done with this. We're trying to get more data on this star. But um, looking at the nutrient capture abundances for this, uh, uh, for the, this particular, it has, again, the same abundance patterns as we've seen in any other r process enhanced star. Um, and actually, we hoped to get a pretty uh, pattern on the star, and especially we, this thorium abundance over here is, is very preliminary at the moment, but hopefully uh, we will get the spectra and we can, we can actually use it to get an H uh, determination for this star. So that's uh, quite exciting. Okay, um, so that's sort of the, the present. We have the opera, uh, the opera says lines, which are gathering data. We have uh, stars being discovered in dwarf galaxies. And so let's move on uh, to the future, um, which is not quite the future, it's sort of already begun, but this is work that can definitely be improved with the samples that will come in the future. So one of the things that can be done when you have these lovely, nice samples of uh, Melpore stars with lots of elements measured is that you can compare the uh, lanthanide fraction in r process and stars with the lanthanide fraction in um, kilonova. So the kilonova that we have in 2017, several groups were able to measure a lanthanide fraction in this event. The uh, black uh, points here in the, in the plot on the right. Um, and what we set out to do in this work, well, well let's measure the lanthanide fraction in metal poor stars, metal poor halo stars also. So we sampled or we gathered a sample of metal poor halo stars with a uh, barium over your European uh, ratio of less than point, minus point 0.4 to make sure that they were enriched by our process, the grand our process. And then we um, took all stars that had three or more nutrient capture elements measured. So we required that they had a light nutrient capture element and some heavy nutrient capture elements measured so that we could um, figure out the ratio between the uh, light and the heavy, and then we use the solar system R process to sort of fill out the rest of them. And what, um, what we got for the entire metal pore halo sample, so not just R process and star, but, but also uh, just normal uh, metal pore stars, is this uh, blue over here, or this blue um, sample over here. And then if we measure the lanthanide fraction in only highly R's, we get the orange uh, curve over on the plot on the right here. Um, so the, 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 mel the yellow melpore star sample could be compatible with the lanthanide fraction found in this kilonova event from 2017, but definitely the highly R process enhanced stars does not, uh, has a sire uh, length and fraction than the, than the kilonova event produced. So this type of work sort of shows that if uh, neutral star mergers are the sole source of uh, our process elements in the universe, well, when we need to have a population of them which has a markedly higher um, length and fraction than what's measured in this one event that we have. Um, 
So this, this is something that we can expand on with, with more samples uh, of MAL4 stars. Another thing is um, the actinide boost stars. So I've touched a little bit upon this already. Um, and basically, we just we know we have these actinide boost stars. We might also have actinide deficient stars. So this guy down here is um, the guy is one of the stars in reticulum two, but um, we don't really know if this requires a separate uh, nucleosynthesis channels to make these stars. We don't really know how many of them we have. Um, so if we get more uranium uh, and uranium measurements, we can. Um, we can fill out this plot a little bit more and, and figure out what's going on with, with those stars. Um, another thing is the light nitrogen capture elements. So I've mentioned several times now that there's a spread in the uh, nitrogen capture element abundances of the light elements. And um, it suggests that we have several formation channels uh, and what uh, a couple of years back is that he found star, the upper system hand stars that all have a light nutrient capture element measured between uh, atomic number of seven. Uh, and when you uh, plot those or you scale those to the uh, solar system R process abundance pattern scaling to zirconium, and then show that this is the residual shown here, you see this downturn in all uh, stars for these elements. Uh, which could be a unique signature of uh, this second formation channel. You also see that the downturn is not consistent or it doesn't uh, follow the europium enhancement, which suggests that, that it's not really that the production of those elements are not really coupled. And this uh, confirms the result from Camilla Hansen from back in 2012, where she measured uh, silver and palladium in a large sample of Malpore stars and found that, that they didn't um, uh, that they weren't co-produced with uh, the heavy elements like barium and europium. Um, finally, we, um, some work has already been again in 2018, where he used uh, this, um, to kinematics for a sample of highly r processed enhanced stars, and then put them through different clustering algorithms to see if they would uh, group together in, in distinct groups. And it turns out that they do. Um, so this very much suggests that um, the opera system enhanced stars that we have in the Milky Way halo were created from small systems like reticulum 2 and Tucana 3 uh, and that type of systems. Um, but this is all their other works. And with the uh, RPA sample, we can do this to a much higher degree. Uh, and then compare with, with what we actually find in also faint dwarf galaxies today. Um, so I just want to end on a maybe non stellar related note. So quite often when people like me say we need more stars, you are told that this is just stamp collection. And to some extent, I guess it is. Um, but curiously enough, I actually also collect stamps in my, <laughs> my private life. Um, maybe this is why this appeals to me so much. Um, but what occurred to me is that even though stamps might look alike, um, so these are four stamps from Denmark, um, which are all relatively, uh, look relatively the same. They have the same value. Uh, these three of them, they have, I know they have like different, um, postal marks, but, um, which we disregard that, that moment. Then we, we have this one stamp on the left, which has, uh, been giving it a different value, and we could call that an actinite boost stamp. Um, but otherwise, they all look pretty much the same. But if we look at them more in detail, um, which would correspond to a detailed abundance analysis, I guess, we see that they are all somewhat different. So this first one has this bump in the K, it's, uh, this little white dot in the D. The third one has, uh, in the third one, the M and the A are not separated. And the fourth one, which we knew was different from the rest of them, turns out also to have this bump in the K. So actually, it's somewhat similar to the first one, but still diff different. Um, so yes, this work is stamp collection, but um, with stamps, that's with stars, we need a large collection to see these different signatures and figure out where they come from. Um, and with that, I will leave you with my summary.
Thank you, Teresa, for a wonderful talk. Um, I would start the discussion. Uh, if you have questions, please feel free to turn on the camera and microphone and raise the hand. I don't see any raised hands so far. Ah, there is Nabin Vijal. You can. Hello. Uh, so I, I had this sort of uh, question, not uh, not clearly a very good question, but uh, uh, you you showed this um, very nice work and and very rich sets of data for these R enhanced star. Uh, so by by utilizing these. Um, some very particular differences in the uh, uh, elemental abundance. Will it be possible to identify or separate different sites for our process uh, synthesis? For example, like the uh, either it is from the merger or from collapser or other uh, sources, at least in the near future. Um, so. The thing is that what we see in these R process enhanced stars is that they all have this very, um, or the, they all have this universal R process abundance pattern in, in, the, in the heavy range, which is um, reproducible by uh, both the collapsers and the new star mergers and stuff like that. Uh, Sample where we what exactly what what percent are the ones in these stars? Three of them are actinide boosted, um, and then we can match that to nuclear synthesis and chemical evolution models and say, well, can we actually a realistic population of, for instance, neutral star mergers, which can reproduce these abundant signatures? Okay, thank you. Do we have more questions for Therese? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, I have a question. So when you compare these uh, abundances with the various stars with the, with the solar abundances, there is a very nice agreement also in the, in the region of lighter elements around strontium and indium and so on. I mean, we have seen in the past some deviations in that region. Why you don't see the deviations in, in, in these plots? And, and what happened in that region, actually, around strontium? Um, so th there is also uh, deviations in, <laughs> in my plots. I think if, if you plot the residuals, you will see that the spread is larger uh, in oh, that yeah. region for, than for the, the heavy uh, R-process elements. Um, and again, I mean, this is what I plotted was 15 stars, which all have a very high uh, enhancement in R process elements. Um, so if I plot the entire sample of 60 stars, then the spread will, will probably become more. Um, what's happening in that region is a good question. I mean, we have uh, several different nuclear synthesis channels that can, can create these elements, yeah. right? I mean, we have not only the uh, main R process, but we have some weak or limited R process. We can have an S process that can create these elements, uh, a weak S process. Um, so, so I think we really need to, to focus on that region and try and figure out what's going on. Thanks. If I might jump in, I would have a question as well. Um, with regards to the sample that you, that you sort of used to search for these R process enhanced stars, uh, I'm a person that comes from the surveys sort of a, a side. Uh, do you, for creating these samples, do you use like a publicly available surveys? Like for example, that you have the Gaia for the kinematics, but then you have, for example, the, the Galag for spectroscopy uh, so for, for, to get some at least metallicities or something. Yeah, so most of our stars are from the RAVE survey. This is sort of our start sample. Um, mm -hmm. And we have uh, used the sky mapper survey also and different other large spectroscopic uh, surveys to that we pick from. Yes. Um, Gaia came somewhat later and this, Gaia has photometry uh, mostly so we can't really pick out um, or not confidently at least yet pick out uh, um, 
call them Melpore stars, we can pick out the bright ones, yes, but we don't know that they're uh, necessarily Melpore. Um, and the glass survey, well, they do a uh, fairly detailed abundance of pattern on their own, so there we already have the Aquasus and Hen stars um, from their results. Um, so yeah, these are, these are from uh, large spectroscopic surveys like the RAVE survey that we, we look at and then pick from them. Okay. Um, let's give someone else an option. Ah, okay, Fernando Montes and then Zach Meisel. Yes, I had a question about the, the R2 stars that you showed. I mean, they had this nice agreement between the stars and the solar system, between strontium and palladium, except molybdenum. Molybdenum yes. had like one text difference between, is there something wrong with molybdenum? Um, well, this is, this is why we need the homogeneous uh, analysis of this large sample of stars, because some of these elements like molybdenum, uh, I think we have like one or two molybdenum lines to work with, um, and they're really hard to measure. So, so we need to make sure we're doing it in a consistent way to see if there really is a spread or an offset or whatever. Um, I think if you look back at my plots, you'll see the same with uh, some of the heavy ones, like Utebium, for instance, that also had a huge spread in, in at least in the Arpus Alliance uh, abundances. And, and that's again, we only have one line to work with. So, so we need to figure out what's going on on there and make sure that, that we do things consistently um, to, to, to assess what, what, the, yeah, what the result is. Okay, thank you. Hi, Teresa. So my uh, question is, is, has to do with how you search for these stars and decide which ones to look at is, um, are you guys, do you pick like the highest signal to noise set in a, in a given survey sample and analyze all those first and then work to the harder cases? Or are you somehow like scanning across the sky in some way? Or I, I don't know. Like, <laughs> so, so, so as I said, uh, many of our sample or many of our target stars are from the radio, the radio velocity well, some, some something experiment with has taken um, spectra of a, a large uh, number of stars in the, in the sky. We've done medium follow-up uh, of many of these stars that were uh, predicted to be uh, metal poor by the RAVE survey. And then from the medium resolution spectra, we can get a uh, better estimates of the malicity and the stellar parameters. And then we go from there and pick for our snapshot survey. Um, B. Plackel had a paper uh, presenting our medium resolution a couple of years ago, I think. So, so yeah, sorry, I should, I should probably have included cool. a slide on this. No, but it's fine. <laughs> so then, how okay. many more but, but, do we expect? You know, that, like what I'm trying to figure out is like, you guys had this huge burst of like, now there's all this more data, uh, all this extra data, which is great. But are you guys going to keep like, is there going to be 70 more cases in the next five years or how, how, do, how um, long should we expect? So, so as I said, we have spectra, snapshot spectra of 2000 stars now. Um, we are probably getting to the end of, of our campaign to get snapshot spectra because we're running out of, of bright stars. Um, there might be some more from SkyMap or survey, for instance, that we can look into. Um, but so far we've only analyzed about 600 of those stars. So there will be a burst <laughs> of more data to come, especially in terms of abundances um, when we get through through the entire snapshot sample. Okay, great, thanks, cool. And there is one more question from uh, Yong Zhong Kian. I hope I didn't <laughs> mispronounce it. That's fine. You don't know me, so it's okay to not to be able to pronounce my name. Uh, hi, Therese. Uh, this is Jan, and uh, congratulations on this, uh, you know, large accumulation of this good data. I noticed that one particular element, uh, ytterbium, in your <laughs> sample, which is uh, very much an outlier in, among the pattern you've shown in, in that region between barium and the third peak and beyond. So yeah, yeah, I noticed that as well the, when I went. Okay, yeah, I should. I, sorry, yeah. I was talking, didn't hear you. What did you say about the the the, the data on uh, UW? Well, I, I just said that I, that I noticed that as well when I made these plots, and I was actually sort of surprised. Um, that I guess there was that um, that Utabian, you have one line with. Um, 
So I would be hesitant to believe that spread uh, that's seen there. I think we need to uh, look at it more closely, figure out what's going on and make sure that, that all of these are actually good measurements and not plagued by um, winds or noise or other sorts of things that can, um, that, that can affect the measurement. Um, so yeah, I think this, this just sort of highlights my point that we need really good uh, spectra to do these measurements um, so that, that we can't say that the, that the spread is due to, uh, due to noise or, or different analysis method. And as I said, um, for the RPA measurements, only three of those uh, spectra are uh, what we call portrait spectra. So some of them are snapshot spectra and um, maybe we need to be a little bit more careful with our JPM measurements in those. All right, thank you. Uh, do we have more questions for Therese? I don't see any hands, so I will just probably ask one more question and then I will give you last opportunity to ask questions. In one of your last slides, you were showing the, the action space or action energy space, the kinematics of the, of the stars that, that you analyzed. Um, are you looking into uh, like associating uh, uh, these stars with uh, like structures in the halo, like the Gaia and Celadus, or do you see some patterns in the in the chemical composition that could came out from from merging dwarf galaxies into Milky Way? Um, so we haven't done that yet, but that's definitely uh, a next step um, once we we get uh, future data releases from Gaia, get the uh, full abundance patterns of of our snow then yes, then we'll definitely do a dynamical and see what comes out. And um, I'm sure there will be uh, stars that are associated with known streams in the in the low and there will be launch clustering, which we already saw a little bit of in Ian's paper, uh, which will tell us that these are uh, these were all born in, 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 in small systems and then later on we feed into them will be um, uh, Milky Way stars, um, but yes, it's definitely it's it's part of the future work. Great, thank you. Uh, probably last chance to to ask questions. I don't see any hands. I guess that's that's all for everyone. Um,